Welcome to the day, today's webinar titled uh, Text Mining Interoperability at the Knowledge Level. This webinar is offered by the Open Minted Project on Text and Data Mining of Scholarly Publications in Europe. The presenter today is Angus Roberts, who is working on the Open Minted Project at the Sheffield, University of Sheffield, UK. This webinar is recorded and will be made publicly available at a later time. By participating in the webinar, you agree to the recording and publishing of the recording, including everything you contribute to the discussion. Please ensure that your microphones are muted during the presentation and whenever you're not speaking. After the presentation, there will be time for questions and discussion. And now over to Angus for the presentation. Thank you, Richard. So as Richard said, this uh, is the fourth in our webinar series, Text and Data Mining Interoperability at the Knowledge Level. Okay, so I'm going to make a few assumptions in giving this presentation. The first is that, uh, I, I, first of all, I will not assume much prior knowledge on your part, and this is because we, uh, as a project, we have a mixed audience. We have people who are um, leading experts in, in text mining and knowledge representation, but at the same time, we have people who um, don't know much about the field at all, but are, are, are really experts in their own fields of research, but want to use text mining. So I'm not many assumptions. Um, I'll assume some limited knowledge of text mining and natural language processing, but not too much, and also some limited knowledge of the semantic web and linked data. Essentially, I have to make a few um, assumptions about your knowledge. The outline of the presentation. So I want, first of all, to explain the open minted context. So the, I'll first of all uh, talk, talk about a little bit about our context. Um, who we are, uh, what we're attempting to do, define a few terms and so on. I then want to talk a little bit about our audience and some sample applications because I strongly believe that this affects how we link things at the knowledge level and how we, how we relate to knowledge. I then want to introduce a, a knowledge landscape, so talk about where knowledge impacts on text mining. And then for the last two parts, I want to talk about how we ensure interoperability between components in a text mining workflow, and then how we uh, ensure interoperability externally with other applications and with the rest of the world. I want to concentrate on that last point and not talk a great deal about interoperability between components, because I think as a project, the external interoperability is our focus at the moment. That's not to say it always will be and that we ignore um, internal interoperability, but uh, it's, it's not our current focus. So we're a European Union Horizon 2020 project. Um, we bring together data mining capabilities from all over Europe. So there's a, an overview of our partners. So there are people there from um, uh, uh, important content providers, uh, people from the text mining world, and people from various domains um, of expertise to using text mining. So Open Minted um, sets out to create an open service-oriented e-infrastructure for uh, text and data mining of scientific and scholarly content. Uh, researchers can collaboratively create, discover, share, and reuse knowledge from a wide range of text-based scientific-related resources in a seamless way. So um, I want to unpick that definition and talk about um, quite what we mean. So text and data mining interoperability at the knowledge level, the, uh, the uh, purpose of today's webinar. What exactly do we mean by those phrases, text and data mining interoperability and the knowledge level? And um, my thanks to uh, Penny for this. Uh, this was from an earlier webinar where um, we talked about these points as well. So first of all, text and data mining. By that we mean that you, we're using this definition from um, Hearst, so discovery by computer of new, previously unknown information by automatically extracting and relating information from different resources to reveal otherwise hidden meanings. So there's a wealth of text out there. I mean, this is a um, something that's, that's com you know, commonly stated these days. 
people talk about the tens of millions of documents in, in one resource or another in, in my own domain, there are tens of millions of uh, documents in the research literature, um, there's terabytes of text, increasing amounts of social media text and so on. How can we mine that to discover new previously unknown information automatically? Interoperability, um, so this is uh, a dictionary definition relating to systems, especially computers um, that are capable of working together without being specially configured to do so. Now clearly there's lots and lots of assumptions in there, but um, it's, it's a, a useful and working definition. The knowledge level, interoperability at the knowledge level, so by the knowledge level we mean um, taking information from some domain or area of human endeavour and representing that in a form that can be used to solve problems computationally. Um, so this is a definition that goes, I, I guess, has roots really in knowledge representation and so on. The important point is that it's, it's some uh, domain such as uh, medicine, agriculture, humanities or so on, and representing knowledge from that domain so that we can manipulate it computationally. So in, in our project, in Open, Open Minted, we're considering two types of knowledge really. So it's knowledge that's either contained in resources that are used by text mining or knowledge that's consumed and produced by text mining. So our question uh, when we're considering interoperability at the knowledge level is how can we ensure that text mining applications can share knowledge resources? So the, the uh, knowledge resources used by your text mining system and the knowledge resources used, used by mine are, are common or can interoperate with each other but also with the rest of the world. How can I ensure that a text mining system that I create is making use of the knowledge resources that are already out there for specific domains? So in order to answer this, we need to look beyond ourselves and, and consider the audience of our infrastructure and that's what I want to do next. So I want to look, look a little bit about our audience first of all. So these, so thanks to um, Natalia and Minola for um, these figures. Um, what's our audience? So essentially we're an infrastructure project. We're trying to build an infrastructure for uh, people to use um, in the text mining world. Infrastructure itself, there are various infrastructure providers around, around the world, perhaps 500 e-infrastructure providers. Um, we're providing one specifically that will uh, deliver text and data mining capabilities, so we need to consider text and data mining researchers, of which there are, there are perhaps less than a thousand around, around Europe. Also content providers, so these are um, publishers, people with document collections and so on, libraries, so perhaps less than 5,000 there. Application developers, so people who are creating specific applications that could be used in a text and data mining context, maybe less than 10,000. But then when we start to look at the people who could potentially use text and data mining, who have an interest in what's in the text from their field study, there are probably more than 100,000. And if you start to look at things like the European Open Science Cloud and the estimates that they have for this, well, there are estimates, I think, um, around 1.7 million. And I like to see this as a, a set of cogs, really. But us in Open Minded um, are, you know, the, the, the small end of this, these cogs, really. We're people like text and data mining researchers and content providers and so on. Um, the researchers in our use cases, and the researchers that are part of our project, actually represent a, a much, much bigger cog. And I think we always have to remember that, that, that the, uh, the world we're trying to interoperate with is far bigger than us. So these next few slides are some examples of, of how and where researchers are, are using text mining at the moment. Um, I just want to show a few examples because I think they pull out some interesting points for interoperability at the knowledge level. So this is um, an example from LifeWatch, um, so it's environmental text mining, and you can see here that the application they're using, it's an online service, um, has highlighted some species, um, so red algae for example, some chemicals, ethanol, methanol and so on, um, some it's highlighted oral cancer cells there and so on. And each of these uh, has been assigned some um, 
type, so in the box below, biological processes, chemical compounds and so on, but also an identifier. And those identifiers are linking these to external knowledge. So the first couple there, are, um, um, apoptotic process and um, execution phase of apoptosis are linking to the gene ontology, a, a, a widely used ontology of um, genetic concepts. And there are uh, links below that to um, chemical com compound knowledge resources and so on. And so the people who are using this to, ex to extract things in text are not only finding species and so on in the text, but they're also relating those to external knowledge. There's a very, very similar example, um, one from my own work um, in life sciences and medical records. And again, we're finding uh, diseases and so on and linking them to external vocabularies. There is a huge, huge number of vocabularies in the medical field and the life science field in general. Um, and this is an application that does exactly that. Uh, in this case, in a hospital setting, usually we use this and it's providing links to uh, to, to health vocabularies and so on. This is a, uh, more sophisticated. This is an example from uh, Europe PubMed Central, which is a, a repository of um, life science literature, full text life science literature. And here, um, links are being created to uh, genes, diseases, proteins, and so on. But more than this, the, the uh, people who are using this can themselves comment on these annotations and um, external providers can provide their own annotations for integration into this platform and so on. So it's uh, starting to become much more sophisticated. Um, this is the last example, uh, which doesn't look um, especially interesting, but it's interesting because it illustrates an, another point, really. This is a, an archaeology data service um, from... Uh, archaeology data service is a, a UK organisation, and here things are being annotated um, for uh, place names, but subjects and temporal expressions and so on. The important point here is, is that in the, in the bottom half of the screen, you're seeing the output from some service API in, in JSON. So this isn't something for an end user to visualize. This is um, a service that somebody's connecting to programmatically. So these examples, I think, the, some important points to pull out from these. First is that they're intended for and used by domain experts. And I think as a, as a project, that's an important point for us to look at and consider. The other point that stems from this and flows from it is they never include low-level lexicosyntactic annotations, by which I mean uh, these services aren't um, churning out and outputting lots and lots of tokens or, or word level annotations of parts of speech of the tokens, the um, grammatical relations between them and so on. This is really is for the end user. The internals, so it's natural language processing internals, are hidden. Um, the usual use case here is they're finding entities of use to end users, so uh, drugs, chemical compounds, um, place names and so on. There weren't any there but um, the, in my examples, but very often the uh, other sorts of text mining services are found, so uh, document classification is quite common, or sentiment analysis. And very often these services are accompanied by some very simple RESTful API, um, usually with some sort of uh, ad hoc JSON output. Not always, so the Europe PubMed Central one, for example, is much more standards based, but often they're very, very um, ad hoc in their representation. And very often they will include some sort of link to an exter external semantics, by which I mean that there's a, a way that you can go from the text to some external knowledge resource that helps uh, provide an anchor meaning for the, uh, the mentions, the terms that are in the text. Okay, so the text mining knowledge landscape. So I want to look a little bit about the, um, the what knowledge there is out there and um, how it how it sits with us as a project and with our um, with our applications and our platform. And I want to look at this in at three levels: first, the ex external versus internal knowledge, so that knowledge that is outside of our applications that that's inside. Mm -hmm. um, linguistic knowledge versus domain knowledge. Um, so, what knowledge is there about the uh, linguistic concepts within an application 
um, as opposed to the knowledge that is specific to the domain of uh, the, within which we're text mining. And then lastly, document versus text level knowledge. So what knowledge is there about the document as a whole and what is there about the internal text of the document? So just to um, start this, let's look at a simple text mining pipeline such as the ones that might have been creating the examples we were just looking at. So we have here an end-to-end -end text mining system uh, that's taking some sort of textual input and creating some kind of structured output. Now within that we, we don't necessarily know what there is and, and certainly with the example systems I showed we don't know what the insides are, but we can assume that there's some set of processes that, that are somehow taking that um, textual input and creating the structured output. Um, and I guess a lot of us might know the sorts of things that would be in there. So things that are finding the individual tokens or words, things that are finding the sentence boundaries, things that are finding the parts of speech, um, looking things up in dictionaries and so on. And some of those internal processes may well use uh, resources that they um, that are specific to them. That is, again, I would describe as internal that we don't see from the from the outside when we're looking at the end-to-end -end system. We don't necessarily know about them. There are other resources though that uh, we do know about. These external resources. So, for example, the um, the, the first example I showed was linking. Uh, turns in the text to the gene ontology. So that's an external resource, the, the gene ontology. And we know about that and it's visible to us. So an important point is how our knowledge resources link um, our output to, um, how, how our output, sorry, links to these external resources, but also how our output links back to the source documents. Okay, uh, a second part of our knowledge landscape is what I describe as linguistic versus domain um, uh, level, linguistic versus domain annotations. So if we imagine we have this sentence here, schizophrenia has a lifetime prevalence of 1%. If we imagine a system that is processing this uh, linguistically in order to create some structured output, it might go through several steps and I, I know they're going to differ with different applications and so on, but you might imagine finding the sentences, finding the tokens, perhaps the parts of speech of those tokens, looking things up in a dictionary, so schizophrenia might appear in a dictionary of uh, mental health problems, lifetime prevalence might be in some um, technical terminology and so on. And you might even do some sort of grammatical parse and find the dependencies between these things. So this is what I'd consider to be a linguistic level of processing. If you imagine doing all of those, the, re the reason you're doing them is in order to produce some final output, to build on the, that linguistic knowledge to create something that is useful for the domain end user, so a specific annotation. And here I've imagined an annotation that has information in it about disorder and about prevalence, so extracting an application that's extracting the prevalence of disorders. And that's a domain specific annotation. So there are these two levels, what's useful to the end user, to the uh, domain expert, but also what's useful um, internally to the uh, text miners who are taking uh, the text and creating this domain specific annotation. What do they need to do along the way? So um, just as the annotations we find may be considered to be at the linguistic or domain level, so the, the knowledge used by our applications, I would say, can be considered to be at the linguistic or domain level. So at the linguistic level, we might be interested in parts of speech tag sets, um, in linguistic categories, so whether, you know, whether something's um, a noun phrase or a verb phrase, it's whether it's a sentence, a term, and so on. At the domain level, we're more interested in how the things we're finding can be linked to uh, terminologies, vocabularies, ontologies that are already in use in the domain. Now there may potentially be some overlap here um, and I'll talk a little bit about that uh, later as well. So the, the uh, other level I think we should consider is, is 
whether things are at the textual level or whether they're at the document or collection level. And by this I mean um, specific annotations. So in my previous uh, example, schizophrenia being a major mental illness with a lifetime prevalence. So the the, the um, mentions of schizophrenia and, and prevalence, if we are to find those and find the relationship between them, then that is somehow anchored in the text. Uh, so it's a, it's a textual level knowledge and a textual level annotation. At the document level, however, we may have information about the, the publication, perhaps it's DOI, um, citation information and so on. And that's information at the document level. We could also consider, I'm not going to mention it at all today, but we could also consider information about the collection as a whole. Um, so a collection of several documents. So at the textual level, we have um, annotations that are anchored directly in the text. So paragraphs, sentences, chunks and so on. Um, parts of speech, word senses. And perhaps importantly for us as well, things like named entities and domain entities. So uh, traditionally in information extraction systems, this would be people, places, and organizations, but uh, moving into other domains and looking at other areas of work, we might want to pull out drugs or species, legal concepts, um, perhaps mentions of machines in the text. So these are all related to the end use domain. We might be interested in things like times, time expressions and so on or other sorts of expression and domain specific facts, so the 1% prevalence or so on in my example. So these are anchored directly in the text. Um, some uh, text level annotations may be anchored to other annotations, so a relation between two annotations, the fact that this prevalence is related to this disease, um, co-reference and so on, um, and at a, a linguistic level dependencies between um, between tokens or between units of text and so on. Or we might have complex combinations of annotations, so a, a citation within a, um, a piece of scientific literature or so on could be combinations of people's names and uh, organizations, titles, date expressions and so on. At the document level, very often the sorts of things we're looking at are, are, is what people would describe as metadata, document metadata, the, uh, authorship, um, uh, publication dates and so on. But also we might be considering things that text mining is added, so it might automatically find the topic of a document. And that's not necessarily something that's um, related to a, a specific piece of text, it might be related to the document as a whole. Similarly with um, sentiment, whether it's expressing a, um, a positive or a negative sentiment, uh, or comments that are ascribed to the whole document and discussion about the whole document. The other thing we can do though is, uh, is abstract potentially any text level annotation and um, place it at the document level. And this is, I think is often seen in um, end use applications where people might find um, a, a named entity but actually when it's output and when it's given to the end user, it's not linked back to the text specifically, it's just linked to the document. So I found this person in this document, but we don't know where it was found. Um, so lexical and linguistic information, as you uh, would expect, is most often applied at the text level, that's where it matters, um, that's where we need to use it. But other information could be uh, applied at any level of granularity. So, so classifications and topics and sentiments and so on could be applied to a document as a whole, but they could be applied to individual sentences or paragraphs. But I would say that any text level annotation can be abstracted up to the document level and often are. So this illustrates that point. So here's um, a, uh, an abstract um, from PubMed. And here we have uh, a piece of text, schizophrenia is a chronic debilitating mental disorder that affects about 1% of the US population. And some application has, has found an annotation in this text, uh, it's anchored specifically to that sentence with a start and an end offset, and um, it's found that the, the disorder is schizophrenia and the prevalence 1%. Um, you could equally well though, uh, 
remove that from the text and link it just to the document without any information about start and end offset. So in this case, uh, on the right hand side, top right, we have schizophrenia uh, disorder prevalence of 1% and it's linked to the DOI of this document to its uh, unique identifier. So what's this mean for us representing knowledge? So how do, for us we need to represent knowledge, how do we recommend linguistic and domain knowledge is represented? That's an important point, all this um, knowledge has to be represented in some way and we need to make some recommendation about that. Also how do we share it, how do we represent annotations and link them to our linguistic and domain knowledge? Um, so we've chosen as a project to recommend use of the link data paradigm and I'm going to give some examples with that um, in the rest of the presentation. Um, and my examples uh, I'll encode using JSON-LD but it could be encoded in other ways as well. So the linked data um, representation, so this is essentially our uh, rationalization of choosing linked data as a paradigm. So linked graphs are a more flexible representation format. Um, uh, they give us uniform access and querying of multilingual knowledge resources. Um, interoperability is uh, um, achieved through common models and easy integration of those common models. Uh, there's a large ecosystem of tools available um, and these tools are widely available under open source licenses. It's very easy to federate data from multiple sources and um, quite trivial. Um, we can help uh, achieve expressivity with existing vocabulary, so in particular OWL and, and Lemon is another one that's important to us as well, help us to express um, um, linguistic information. Semantics, very, very important from what I was saying before, so allowing us to link to resources um, and express what we mean by um, linking the text to some external resource and also the linked data paradigm is dynamic and so it can be continuously improved and is. So first of all I want to look as I said earlier just a little bit about interoperability between components. I want to concentrate more in this presentation on interoperability um, externally but I want to look a little bit at between components first. So um, as a project we um, how to approach selection of resources and for, in, for internal inter interoperation between components within some text mining workflow. And the areas we've looked at here are um, uh, linguistic resources, terminology and uh, conceptual resources such as ontologies, and also um, resources that are to do with text structure. And the, the methodology we, that we've chosen really is to, is to look at popular concrete de facto standards, um, things that are, that are really used by people and also though know, things that projects may have created that provide good connectors between some of these other things. Um, and in order to link between schemes and categories we've, uh, we're using SCOS which is again you know, widely used within the linked data field. The important point though about what we do choose is we in choosing things we're not saying that that's the end, that uh, we have to make sure that our, um, our selection is extensible and incrementally extensible but we do also have to choose an initial set of resources. So the sorts of resources we've been looking at for um, linguistic knowledge, encoding linguistic knowledge, um, there's some in this list here but some of the ones we've, that have uh, been most important to us are uh, the LAPS exchange vocabulary which is a vocabulary of common linguistic elements, um, universal dependencies, pen tree bank widely used for part of speech tagging but also resources like ISOCAT and, and GOLD and so on which uh, describe uh, linguistic terminology and linguistic concepts. Um, We've also, of course, had to look at type systems that we have within our own consortium. So just to uh, describe one of these, so LAPS um, on the next slide, uh, so to give you an idea of, for those who don't know the sorts of things that um, LAPS and some of these other uh, resources do. So LAPS essentially is um, 
modeling the linguistic world and modeling the, the, the concepts within that. So here you see that annotations could um, uh, relate to a, a region of text or a, a relation between uh, bits of text. So regions of text themselves could be paragraphs or sentences, noun chunks, verb chunks, and so on. So LAPS is, is useful in giving a, a high level view. In, in some ways, it's, um, it's lacking though. For example, uh, named entity, you can see there, um, has, has you know, only got a few data types and perhaps there's, there's some ways of extending LAPS to, to um, better fit some of the data that we use. The other point we have to approach though is lexical and terminological knowledge. So the, 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 the um, lexicons, the, the list of words, the dictionaries and so on that are often used within text mining applications. Um, and this is important for us at an internal level. Often when uh, components are um, interoperating, they, they may well have to um, share lexicons or, or have some knowledge of the lexicon that another component has used, but also at the external level as well, because often lexicons and, and terminological resources are where the, um, the internal world of natural language processing and text mining meets the external world of the um, specialist domain. So there are two major uh, resources there we've been looking at, the Lexical Markup Framework, which is um, a way of modeling lexical resources and providing a common machine readable format for lexical um, resources. But moving beyond the, the, um, the list-based lexicons and gazetteers, we're also uh, looking at Lemon, which is a, a linked data model, so it fits very well with the paradigm that we've chosen for representing lexical information relative to ontologies, and that's um, that's based on the um, lexical market framework and uh, is being developed now by the um, W3C's OntoX community group. So just to give you an idea of what uh, what Lemon and resources like Lemon are about, on the next slide I've got a, a diagram of Lemon. So here we see the sense that a, a we have some lexical entry, something in a, a lexicon. Um, sorry, we have a lexicon first of all on the left, don't we? Which may consist of, of many lexical entries, and those lexical entries may themselves be words, phrases, or, or parts. Um, and the lexical entry could have several different senses. And the important point to think of Lemon for us is that, that those lexical senses um, reference something in an ontology. So here we're starting to. Uh, build a link between the uh, conceptual model of the world that uh, a domain expert might have and the um, lexical terminological model that is needed in the text mining world. And as I said, importantly, this is being done in a, a, a linked data paradigm. So external operability, this is, I think, for us as a project, as I said, this is um, the important point at the moment. This is what we're concentrating on at the moment, um, trying to uh, find a way forward here. So we're proposing to offer two ways for end-to-end -end services. So this isn't about the internals now. This is about how we interoperate with the external world. Two ways for end-to-end -end services to interoperate with the external world. So the first is um, uh, based on UEVA XMI. So XMI is an XML-based um, um, meta model interchange format for um, the, the UEMA uh, XMI for, for defining uh, textual documents and the annotation within those documents um, and by referencing those to some um, type system. So this mirrors very much how our components interoperate internally. A, a lot of the um, internal components from our own consortium are UEMA based or are, are based on, on systems such as GATE that can operate quite um, easily with UEMA. Um, we expect this level though to be of most interest to those who are operating at the detailed linguistic level and existing component providers and we're considering exactly what type systems to use in that case. The other um, way of um, interoperating though is um, uh, a, a, a web a, a based around web annotation, which I'll explain in a minute. Um, so semantics there being provided via the semantic web and being provided by um, semantic resources that are developed within 
um, domains themselves. So web annotation is an emerging W3C standard for sharing and reuse of annotations. So um, and one example of its use is exactly the PubMed Central Europe uh, example I showed you earlier, where um, PubMed Central are, are um, providing annotations in web annotation for output on their system and allowing people to upload other annotations uh, and so on, and sharing annotations, commenting on them and so on. So the, the standard consists of a data model, which I'll look at a, a little bit, a vocabulary, and also a protocol. Um, so the, the basic point of this um, standard is to support annotation of many media types, not just text, but um, also video, sound, etc., etc. And it, it's very much targeted, particularly the protocol part of it, at, at systems that manage the transport and sharing of annotations. So it's about retrieving the annotations about a document or about editing the annotations that are about a document and so on, um, or, or adding some annotation to an existing annotation store. So it's not so much focused on how the annotations get created in the first place and the, the internal technologies that might be building and making those annotations. Um, and the other point about it, which I think we need to consider, is that it expects that the target of annotations, the things that are being annotations, are going to be part of the web. So here's just a, an example from the W3C. Uh, it's a very simple annotation um, of, so it's a piece of text annotating some uh, target web page. So as you can see, it's got a, a, a context. So as I was saying before, my examples I'm using uh, JSON LD. There's an identifier, an identifier for this annotation that is uh, some URI has a type of annotation. And other, we could use other types here, which we, we will, and I'll show you. And then the annotation itself has a body, which is the, the meat of the annotation. And in this case, it's just a very simple textual comment. And that comment is linked, the annotation is linking that comment, that body, to some target, to some target web page. Okay, so I want to now go through an example of how this might apply to some real um, service out there and how we might uh, adapt that service to use this kind of output and to link to external knowledge. So this example is from the um, Open Air project. Um, it's a web service uh, that you can um, paste or post if you're posting um, uh, scientific um, articles to, and it will find information about funding. Who has funded this project? What funding information is there in this project? Um, so the sorts of things I mean are shown here. So under acknowledgments, this is. Um, in this paper here, it says this paper presents work done in the framework of the project T4ME, and it's got a grant number, um, and the QT launch plan project with a grant number as well, and it says who they were funded by, um, funded under FP7, etc. Um, so it's information about how this was funded. And if you're working in the field of, I guess, of um, uh, science funding and so on, then it's useful to extract this. So if we were to paste this in, in this case, it's, it's the, the, I know that the top part's quite fuzzy. That's just a piece of Lauren Ipsen text from the example uh, that this is running on. But the important point is that um, that's been submitted. And down at the bottom there, there's a little piece of JSON underneath the submit button. This is what it's returned. So it's returned some funding information extracted from the text. Um, and in the next slide, uh, we see that in a little bit more detail. And, Formatted. So essentially, this system's outputting funding info. It's outputted two um, funding infos, both with their, um, the fund that they're from, the grant IDs, um, and confidence, and so on. And it's very, very straightforward, simple, and it's very, very similar to the sorts of output that lots of existing text mining, end to end text mining systems create. So here I've taken this and Try to represent it in JSON LD with um, with Richard's help. But if, if there are errors in this, <laughs> they're all mine. Um, I have to confess, I, I, I did uh, on an early version of this, I, I did verify that it was correct by 
I haven't on this um, version I'm showing here. So I've just represented one part of it and elided one of the bits of funding information. So, um, no, uh, so I think, as you can see there, we've had to uh, define namespaces, we've had to start defining identifiers and so on that did not exist in the earlier um, JSON from the original system. However, by doing this, we begin to create more interoperability. The key part of this, though, is the actual funding information at the bottom there. And this is essentially the information that's created by the application at the moment. And the rest of it is about providing the interoperability. Now, there are some things that we need to bear in mind here and need to consider. The first is, um, and they're all shown in red here, the first is that we have to define some sort of context, some sort of namespace in which our um, type information, so things like confidence and fund and um, acronyms and so on, in which they exist and which define the semantics of those and how they relate to each other and how they relate to the rest of the world. Um, also, we have to define identifiers for things and uh, most importantly at the bottom, as I said before, web annotation is targeted at the semantic web. Um, the, the target has to be some identifier for a, a document that, that lives there out in the wild. So linking to external knowledge, um, so th the default case, uh, semantics are provided by, we would expect, by the service provider. So if somebody's providing an end-to-end -end service, then they would provide semantics, and the, the person who provided that funding system would, would provide some sort of namespace that defined the semantics of their types. Or they may not, and I think in many cases that would be the case that people would not properly type what they've done, and you know that's actually how a lot of people in the text mining world do live. Um, so there may be no semantics or limited semantics, but of course if somebody does that, then they have to accept that that limits their interoperability in this world. So we would encourage service providers to also provide useful semantics that go beyond. Uh, just defining a, a simple list of, um, of types in their own namespace. And I show an example of how you might do that with the, the funding example I showed you. So this is a, um, a funding vo vocabulary, a funding ontology, in fact, which, um, which exists and which people do apparently use. I have to confess I don't know much about this area, so I couldn't um, verify for sure that this is widely used, but it does seem to have some traction and has... Um, classes such as funding and grants and so on, and uh, uh, dates, etc., that you might perhaps be able to extract from these documents. And this is defined um, it, as a, a, a linked data ontology, so perfectly usable within our, um, within our framework. And the person who produced the funding application that I demonstrated they could, I believe, quite easily adapt what they're doing to use at least some of the terms within this. The other good thing about this, though, and I think this starts to point to the strength of using the linked link data paradigm that is shown on the next slide, because this itself builds on the FOF ontology, the friend of a friend ontology, which um, defines how people, organizations, and so on are related to each other. So we're starting to, you know, if, if our user, if our, our end-to-end -end system creator, sorry, was to create a system that built on this funding ontology, they would start to um, interoperate at a much um, higher level with other systems out there that make use of FOF and with this funding ontology, etc. So one thing that uh, we must say about the funding application I showed there is that it, it assumes that there's no link back into the text. So the application doesn't create um, text level annotations. It just says that this document has information about funding. This is the grant number. Uh, this is a, a, an FP7 funded project, etc. It doesn't point to where this was in the text at all. It's a document level annotation. And as I say, this is often the case. However, if we want to provide 
text level annotation, then web annotation does support that. It does support selection of fragments. Um, so the Europe PubMed Central example that I showed earlier on um, is exactly that kind of work. Um, however, if you want to start representing large amounts of um, uh, text, textual, uh, text level information, so all the tokens that are in there, um, their parts of speech and so on, then it, it, it may not um, be suitable. I mean, you could do it, but you might find that you're um, uh, starting to, um, well, your systems might start to creak under the weight of it. Um, but for the, for the, certainly for the output and for um, interoperating with the external world, I think it's, um, it's, a, it's a good choice. So there's some open questions. So one of the other points that I showed in, uh, in the example was that um, uh, we, need, we need identifiers for annotations. We need identifiers um, uh, within a, a web annotation document. Now, where do they come from? Do users assign their own? Um, do we provide a service to assign those? Uh, one suggestion that, that I've heard made is that users assign identifiers that are unique at the document level and only at the document level, and that somehow, as a um, if the open-minded, open-minded platform itself should then make them um, unique at, at the world level. Um, but then also, how do we deal with the annotation target when this does not have an identifier? So. In the, in the PubMed Central world, um, every document that they are uh, they are presenting and, and annotating, allowing people to annotate, will have a DOI and they can identify it in that way. Um, but what if it's somebody who's just uploading a load of documents from their um, from their hard drive and annotating those? What do we do about identification within web annotation? And I think those cases will be fairly common. So. The, another another question is so if you look at Europe Europe PubMed Central and, and other users as well they also allow people to input annotations into their systems using um, web annotation and I think we'll find that an increasing number of content providers will provide annotations in this way um, and they they are already out there in fact so if we want to ingest content from them then we will need to deal with that as well and um, we need to be able to ingest them. So finally, um, on my last slide, uh, I just want to outline the, the, you know, our next steps and the directions we're going in for the knowledge level interoperability and then open it up to discussion. So um, first of all, we need to more clearly define our use of web annotation and also how, um, how it relates to our use of um, XMI. Um, also, Clearly, we need to further investigate the use of knowledge resources in our existing use cases and select those knowledge resources that are, are of interest to our existing use cases as well, as well as continuing the work on knowledge resources at the uh, linguistic and um, intercomponent um, level as well. So thank you. I hope um, uh, you've enjoyed this uh, presentation and I, I um, hope you all would like to join in now with questions and discussion and so on.